Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We bless your name because you have kept us alive to see a preview of where we're going to spend eternity as your children. We're praying, Lord, as we study about this great, holy, heavenly city of Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, we pray you prepare us as we are preparing the city for us in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, you open our eyes of understanding so we can behold and see glorious things, great, bright things awaiting your children in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that while we're here, this day of probation, preparation for the coming kingdom for the future, we pray, Lord, you help us not to leave any stone unturned, but we will be fully prepared for that glory above in Jesus' name. Whatever may, be, may still be in any of our lives that will, not, that will hinder us from getting to that place, remove it even tonight in Jesus' name. Be glorified in our lives. And as we prepare us, we pray that you use us to prepare other people too for that glorious city up above. Be with us as we study tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray. We come back to our study of the book of Revelation. We're coming to the end of the book of Revelation. We're already in chapter 21. And as we look at chapter 21, you remember, last week we studied about the new Jerusalem. Why don't you turn to verse 1 of Revelation chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. That gives us the introduction to that coming city, the future city, that glorious city that the Lord himself is preparing for his own. And John said in verse 1, I, John, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And then he said in verse 3, he said, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write it down. Write. For these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. That's what we learned uh, last week. What we studied about is the heavenly city, the city of God, the new Jerusalem. Actually, as you look at that passage I read to you, John the Beloved will see the holy city from outside. But then, as we're going to look at it today, it goes inside. And he wants to look at the city from the inside today. In this vision, the apostle John saw the holy city. This is the heavenly city. A place, number one, of happiness without sorrow. Different from this world. Distinct from this world. Desirable above this world. A place of happiness without sorrow. Number two, it's going to be a place of life without death. Because it tells us there, he'll wipe all tears away from all eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Not only that, number three, it's going to be a place of contentment without crying. You see, in this world in which we live, sometimes you might feel that you have enough. And you are contented and satisfied with what you have, but... Just a few moments after that, there's going to be crying, or sighing, or sorrow, or sadness, or pain, or sickness. Then, number four, it's going to be a place of pleasure without pain. That when we eventually come to that place, and pleasure is uninterrupted, and the pleasure goes on forever without any pain. Number five, it's going to be a place of fellowship without separation. 
How many times we're having fellowship in this world and it may be that something will take the person we're fellowshipping away from us. It may be even the death that will take him away and then we have the bereavement and you have fellowship or there's separation. But in that place when you come there, it will be fellowship without separation. Number six, it's going to be a place of satisfaction without disappointment and what a day that will be when there will be total satisfaction complete satisfaction inward and outward satisfaction uninterrupted satisfaction without any disappointment at all number seven it is going to be a place of gladness without sadness number eight a place of perpetual health without sickness or weakness and here John now describes from the inside what he had described from the outside in the previous passage, which I read to you now. Then he describes this, and he goes inside the gate right now. And then as he goes inside the gate, and he walks in the streets of gold, he describes everything for us. I'm reading the passage you are studying today now from verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which are the seven vials, full of seven la of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, so he could see it very well, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And a light was like unto a stone, most precious, even like a just stone, clear as crystal. And at a wall great and high, at twelve gates, and at the gate twelve, at the gates twelve angels, and the names and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates. And on the west three gates, and the wall of the city are twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he, and he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof, and the city lieth for score. And the length is as large as a breath. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, and 140 and 4 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper. And the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished, that is beautified, with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, and the eighth burial, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, and the eleventh a jacinth. The twelve and amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God is light in it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of their do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. For there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it any sin that defileth. Neither whatsoever walketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And that's the vision that John the beloved saw. It's like the curtain is drawn aside for us to see a glimpse of our eternal city. This is the place which God has prepared for all who love him and who worship him in spirit and in truth. 
what we are looking at today is a dwelling place of all saints of all ages. Actually, the Lord had said he was repairing a place like this. He said the place is so beautiful and wonderful. It's something that eyes have never seen. It's something that ears have never heard. And it's something that has never entered into the heart of man. That glorious place, that beautiful place, that splendid place that the Lord is preparing for his own. In Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64 verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither as I seen, O God, beside thee, what he has prepared for him that waited for him. He's talking about the people that know the Lord, the people who have turned away from their sins, those who have repented of their evil. And now because they are children of God, and God so delights in them, is preparing a place for them. And here Isaiah, he said, nobody has seen this. Nobody has heard this. It has not entered into the heart of man, the great sin, the glorious sin, the bright sin, the splendid sin. The Lord is preparing for his own. And he says, this glorious sin, this wonderful sin, God is preparing for his own. What a wonderful sin is going to be on that wonderful day. Something that men never thought about. Something that men never imagined in their lives. But now God is preparing for his own. The question is, who are his own? Those who have turned away from sin. Who are his own? Those who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are his own? Those who are living righteous lives. Who are his own? Those who by grace are walking steady according to the watch of the Lord. Those are the people they delight in God and God delights in them. They love God and God loves them. And they have prepared their heart for the Lord and the Lord is preparing a place for them. Actually, that's exactly what Jesus Christ said in John chapter 14. And I'm reading to you from verse 1. John chapter 14, reading from verse one, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He was telling his own disciples, you know those disciples, and they were thinking, we're going to miss the Lord. He has been telling us he's going away. Are we going to be in fellowship again? Oh yes, we're going to be in fellowship with him again. In this world, your fellowship with anyone will be broken. You'll be separated in, maybe in a few moments time. But when you come to that place in heaven, that's where you'll never be separated from the Almighty God. You'll never be separated from Christ the Redeemer. You'll never be separated from the Holy Ghost, our Comforter. You'll not be separated again from the believers. And Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Neither, don't let each be afraid. But you believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house. How I many mansions? If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And then the beautiful thing is in verse 3. It says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there ye may be also. And then as Paul the apostle eventually came to know the Lord, and he was called. And he began to have revelation of this thing that uh, we're talking about. Then he began to say himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. He tells us, but as it is written. What does that mean, as it is written? We've read it already in Isaiah chapter 64. It was written in Isaiah. And now the new revelation, the glorious revelation, the bright revelation came to Paul the apostle himself. And he said, yes, I've seen it myself. It's the third heaven. It's a great paradise. And I saw things I couldn't describe to you. And I had words I couldn't explain to you. And then he said, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And you see here what, the, what Paul the Apostle is saying. The revelation we're looking at today, that John is privileged to see today, and is revealing to us, both Isaiah and Paul the Apostle said, you've never seen this. No matter where you have traveled to in the world, you have never heard about this. This has never entered into the heart of man. The glorious sin and the great sin, the bright sin, the splendid sin that the Lord is preparing for his own. Actually, that will remind you that we are just strangers in this world. We are pilgrims in this world. Heaven is our home. And we're told over and over in scripture. Let me just read one or two passages to you telling you that this place is not your home. 
This place is not your permanent abode. We're just strangers and pilgrims over here. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 10. In Hebrews 11 verse 10, For he looked for a city which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. It's talking about Abraham. And it's talking about all the other patriots. It's talking about all the people that ever lived in this world and they believe the Lord. They realize there is a better place. There is a greater place. There is a more glorious place where they were looking for. For he looked for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. And then he tells us in verse 13, these all died in faith. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Have you realized that yourself today? That you are just a stranger here? And that you are just a pilgrim here, and you are just passing through. All those patriarchs of all the people of all the prophets of old, this is what they realize were just strangers and pilgrims here. And then it says in verse 14 for day that says such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country. That is an heavenly wherefore god is not ashamed to be called their god for he has prepared for them a city and that's the city we're looking at today the new jerusalem the holy city the heavenly city the abode of god and the abode of the people of god we are already citizens there we're just a pilgrims here, strangers here in first peter chapter 2 verse 11 first peter Chapter 2, verse 11, dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly laws which war against the soul. And that means something is fighting against you. Somebody, someone is fighting against you. He doesn't want you to be there because he has missed it already and it's not going to be there. And he says, how can I lose the privilege and you gain the privilege? How can I miss that glorious place? And then you are going to spend eternity there. Therefore, he's walking against you night and day, every moment. And you've seen everything he can use, everyone he can use to fight against you. That's why it says, dearly beloved, is this glorious city your goal? Is this beautiful city your ambition? Is this your desire? Then it says, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims here on earth. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. But we are citizens of heaven already. If you are born again, if you are a child of God, and if you know the Lord as your personal Savior, we are citizens of heaven already. In Philippians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 20. Philippians 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven. And that actually is saying our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the walking whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. If we are citizens of heaven and we're strangers and pilgrims here, what are we doing here then? Well, we're still here because we have a work to do, because we're ambassadors for Christ, because we're pleading with people, reconcile with the Lord, repent and turn away from sin, and so you can be to a candidate of the kingdom of God in Second Corinthians chapter five. I'm reading verse twenty. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty. It says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, we're begging you, we're pleading with you. In Christ said, be ye reconciled to God. That's why we're still here. Actually, our Father is in heaven. Number two, our Savior is there. Number three, our name is written there already. Number four, our citizenship is there. Number four, five, we are setting our affections there already. And then number six, our treasures are there. Number seven, our inheritance is there. What a glorious thing, what a wonderful thing then. If you are born again and God is your father 
And you say, a father which art in heaven. And then you know about Jesus Christ, your Savior. He left this world and then he went to heaven. That's where he said he was going. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when he's coming back, he'll be coming back from heaven. And not only that, if your name is written in the book of life, the book of life is not on earth, it's in heaven. And if you're born again, the moment you're born again and your sins are taken away, then he writes your name in that book by the throne of the Almighty God. And then that means that you are a city in there. You have, your, you have your ID already. That is your identification mark. And the Lord sets the seal. He said, I know the people that are mine. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And then your, your affections are there. If you be risen with Christ, they seek those sins which are above where Christ is seated beside the throne of God in heaven. And then it says that you will set your affections on things on high. Not only that high about your treasure. Because where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. And God has prepared for us an unfading, an undying, an unlimited inheritance there in heaven. And you see, our friends, they only have information about heaven, but who have inheritance in heaven. And that's why the Lord is telling you that you make sure you are ready if you are not ready yet. If you have not repented yet, if you have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ yet, that you get yourself ready so that you will know you have an inheritance up in heaven. The appearance of this city we're talking about revealed unparalleled beauty and grandeur. The size of it, the combination of the five branch colors and the layout of the city, they make it glow as a brilliant gem in the sky, what a city this is. Let's study it together. We're dividing the message today to three parts. Number one, the description and the dimensions of the heavenly city. The description and the dimensions of the heavenly city. Number two, the delight and the destiny of its holy citizens. The delight and the destiny of its holy citizens. Number three, the defiled, denied entry into the heavenly city. Let's come back to number one. The description and the dimensions of the heavenly city. Well, we're coming back to Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter 21, we're looking at verse 11. As he talks about the city, please back up to verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And a light was like unto a stone, like most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Uh, the great city, that is the eternal city, is referred to as the bride of Christ. Uh, as you look at this, it's saying, saying it's like the bride of Christ. And then you are wondering, why is it referred to as the bride of Christ? Go to verse 9. And there, and there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials of, full of seven of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And, in, and he's showing him the bride. He showed him the city. Actually, there is an uh, uh, identity here or identification of the bride with the city. It's a place, yes. But it's a place where the bride will stay. Where the bride will live. Where the bride will dwell for all eternity. And this city referred to as a bride. It is referred to as a bride because of its virgin beauty. On stage or scene. As you look at the description of this city, what do you learn about this city? Number one, it's unstained by sin. All the sins of the world will never reach that place. Because it's something that has been perfected by God. It's something beautified by God. It's something garnished by God. And it has spotless beauty, virgin beauty. Number one, unstained by sin. Number two, untouched by Satan. Do you see that before the revelation of this glorious city, this great city, and this, thing, this place the Lord is preparing for his son, that Satan had been, put into the, had been put into the lake of fire 
and never to come out of that place to come and defile or touch or stain this great city. That's why he's called the bride, because of his virgin beauty. Number three, because of the, it is undefiled by sinners. No sinner is allowed to come in inside this place. And because it, they are not allowed to come there, that means the beauty is preserved. That's why it's referred to as the bride, as pure as a bride, as holy as a bride, as heavenly as a bride, as spotless as a bride. Look at verse 8. It says, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the all mongers and the, and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake we burn with fire and brimstone, which is the second day. Those sinners will not be there to defile its beauty. Look at verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever walketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are reaching in the last book of life. Number one, it's unstained by sin. Number two, it's untouched by Satan. Number three, it's undefiled by sinners. Number four, it's unchanged by seasons. You know, when you build a good house in this world, dry season, rainy season, winter, cold, Summer, sunshine, everything coming on that uh, building, eventually it will be depreciating. It will be losing its value. And if you saw it about five years ago, and you're still seeing it today, except you are retouching it every time, it's going to look as if what, what kind of house is this. But you see, there will be no seasons uh, that appear in the world to appear in heaven, in the new Jerusalem, to defile or to deface or to destroy the beauty of that holy Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem. It will be unchanged by seasons. Number five, unparalleled in its substance. Have you seen when I read it to you? All the stones there, all the precious stones there, all the substance uh, with which everything was built unparalleled by a, in its substance. Number six, unequal in its size. Did you see the size? When I read it, look at verse 16. And the city light was squirm. And the length of it as large as the breadth of it. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. That is 1,500 miles. The length, 1,500 miles. And the breadth, 1,500 miles. And the height of that great city, 1,500 miles. You understand? When it says the height is also 12,000 furlongs, that is 1,500 miles. What, what that means is that you have layers of mansions. On the ground, uh, on the ground, on the ground floor, you have mansions, mansions, mansions. Uh, 1,500 miles length and 1,500 miles breadth. And for those of us who are uh, used to calculation, that is uh, 2 million and uh, 250,000 square miles. Just a ground floor and then another floor and then another floor and then another floor until the height is 1,500 miles. That thing is unequal in size. And then number seven, unfading in splendor. Unfading in splendor. And what a wonderful thing it will be if you will be there. I pray you'll be there in Jesus' name. And that's why it's referred to as the bride. It is the eternal residence of the bride of Christ. And of all the saints of all ages, the builder and the maker of this celestial city, heavenly city, holy city, is God himself. The city is described as being full of blazing, brilliant glory of God. Everything there is transparent. Have you seen the description of it? It says, number one, it is clear as crystal. Number two, it is like unto clear glass. Number three, it is as if it were transparent glass. Number four, the gate shall not be shut at all anytime. Number five, there will be no night there. Look back into your Bible. Revelation chapter 21 verse 11. Revelation chapter 21 verse 11. Having the glory of God... And a light was like unto a stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. That's how transparent it is. And then in verse 18, look at what it says. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper. And the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. 
clear as crystal and then unto clear glass. And then in verse 21, it says, And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Do you see the description, the beauty of it, and the brightness of it, and the glory of it, as clear as glass, as clear as crystal, and then transparent glass. Then it tells us in verse 25, and it says, And the gates of it, and, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all, day or night. And then it says, For there shall be no night there. Transparency. Can I tell you something? As transparent as that place is, only the transparent will get there. Nothing shady, nothing covered, nothing hypocritical, nothing insincere, nothing covered up. If you are covering up and you are not transparent, you're not going to be there. Because that place is so, so transparent. And look at what the Bible says in First Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 5. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Here it tells us, Therefore judge nothing before the time, until the, time, until the Lord come. What does that mean? It says if you are trying to investigate a matter, you, don't, you can't find head or tail about it, leave it off. It will be revealed later. When that fellow covers it up and covers it up and covers it up and he covers it up to the point that you can never detect it. Don't, don't track your brain about it. Just, just give it up. And it says, therefore just nothing before the time until the Lord come who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness. What are you worrying about it now? It will eventually be brought out. All the hidden things of darkness, all the things that are being covered up, all the things that people feel that nobody can know it today, we've covered it up so much, and the people that could have revealed it will silence them. It says, don't worry about it, that day when the people of God, the righteous saints of God, the holy people of God, the saints, when they're going to go to that glorious place that is transparent, all the people that are not transparent, they're covering up things, they'll be hindered from getting there and will make manifest the counsels of their hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. And that tells us then that wonderful place where we're going to be. There'll be no obstruction there. There'll be nothing to block the blessing glory of the almighty God. And that city is laid out as a cube in dimensions. Each side of the city is 12,000 fol 12, furlongs. That means 1,500 miles in measurement. The glorious eternal city is 2,250,000 square miles in one layer of mansions alone. You know what that means? They have calculated it for or some experts at the streets rise up over streets. What 1500 miles, millions of intersecting layers of avenues are there. The ground floor alone, think about this the ground floor alone would provide enough living space for far more people than have ever lived in the history of the whole world. That you see the accommodation were to be like this wall. But to not be like this wall, you have mansions and mansions and mansions. And then it says, if the ground floor is just like that, and yet there are 1,500 miles of additional floors above it, what a great city that will be. And that heavenly city is big enough for all who will seek the Lord and will find and walk in the narrow way that leads to life eternal. And then let's go into depth of a day. It's a city we're talking about in a Revelation chapter 22 verse 5. Revelation chapter 22. I'm reading to you from verse 5. And there shall be no night there. And they, and they, need, no, and they need no candle. Neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. I thought you will say amen. In Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 4. We're looking at verse 5. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 5. Glorious city, beautiful city, a blazing city, and a brilliant city. So, so glorious. In Isaiah chapter 4, reading from verse 5, and the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day, and a shining of, the, of a flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense. What a glorious scene it will be in, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 48. 
38. Ezekiel chapter 48, reading from verse 31. Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 31. And the gates of the city shall uh, 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 and the gates of the city shall be after the names of the tribes of Israel. Three gates, not watch. One gate of Reuben, one gate of Judah, one gate of Levi. Uh, what a wonderful thing. There are many people that have their names on streets in the world here. And they say, uh, so and so avenue. And they say, so and so crescent. And they say, so and so road. And they say, so and so street. Maybe you are wondering your name is not there. Why do you worry about that? All these people that we have here, they may not have their names in the cities of this world. But this glorious city and this bright city and this splendid city, the Lord is saying their names will be there. In verse 32 it says, at the east side, 4,000. Uh, verse 32, at the east side, 4,500, and then three, uh, three gates, and one gate of Joseph, and one gate of Benjamin, and one gate of Dan. And at the south side, 4,500 measures, and three gates, and one gate Simeon, and one gate of Issachar, and another gate, one gate of Zebulon. In verse 34, and the west side, 4,500, with the, well, there are three gates, one gate of God, and one gate of Asher, and one gate of Naphtali. It was round about 18,000 measures and the name of the city from that, from that day shall be the Lord is there. The name of that city shall be the Lord is there. You, you see the names now. Number one is called the bride and it's called the holy city and it's called the heavenly city and it's the new Jerusalem and then what a great name is just Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there a glorious place i will be there in revelation i'm reading from revelation chapter 4 in revelation chapter 4 we're looking at verses 2 and 3 revelation chapter 4 verses 2 and 3 and immediately i was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he that sat Upon he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like an emerald. Uh, it's just describing to us the color, the beauty of that place. Uh, how does somebody get into this place? How will you be there if you were to be there? It tells us Revelation chapter 22 because it's not for everybody. There are people that will not be admitted into that transparent city. They are not transparent. There are people that will not be allowed in that holy city. They are not holy. There are people that will not be allowed in that heavenly city. They are not heavenly minded. There are people that will not be allowed in that delightsome city because they are not delightful themselves. But the people that are going to be there are the people that have turned away from their sins. They have turned away so completely and they have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Inward, outward, private, public, in the house, in the church, in the market, in the office, they are free from sin. And because they are free from sin, that's why the Lord is going to admit them into that place. Revelation chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Blessed are they, they have, been, they have been forgiven, but not only forgiven, they are free, free from sin. And they do no iniquity anymore, and they do the commandments of the Lord, and it says they are blessed because they are holy. They are obedient to the commandments of the Lord, and they will have the privilege and the right of entering in, through the gate into that city, and they will have right to the tree of life. How about the people that are not saved? How about the people that are backsliding? How about the people that are hiding their sins? How about the people that are always hearing the word of God and what they hear does not make any difference in their lives, doesn't make any change, any transformation in their lives? Look at verse 15. For without outside are the dogs. You know the dogs? When you see dogs, they are not ashamed of anybody. If they want to commit whatever they want to commit, they do it right outside there. Before the gaze of everyone. And there are those men and women who commit their immorality in the, op in the open. They won't even hide it. And they, they may stay on the, on the street corner. And, and beckoning you to come if you want to go to hell with them. And they are like dogs. And it says, outside are the dogs. 
Do you see those dogs that fight and bark and bite one another? Outside are the dogs. The people that hurt one another and the people that bite one another and the people that they backbite and they front bite. They, front bite. they, they bite you while you are there. They bite you while, while you are not there. They don't care what, what you feel or what. Even if you know them, even if you see them, they don't worry about it. They're like the dogs. They can fight in the open. Their violence is carried everywhere, outside and inside. And without, outside are the dogs. And then it says, and the sorcerers. Those are the, the, peop, the witches and the wizards and the occultic people. It says they're outside. And the allmongers, adulterers, fornicators, and the murderers, and the idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. It tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. It says the day is coming when we'll see everything clearly. All the things we're trying to unravel, we're trying to untie, we're trying to, we're trying to understand today, we can't understand them. They are covered away from us. They are hidden away from us. And we search and search. We use scientific methods, psychological methods, spiritual method, and intelligent method to be able to know the depths of what we are looking for. And we can't discover it. So we just give up and say, this is the world. That's the nature of the world. You are not going to be able to discover everything that everybody does here in the world. But then it says, that bright day, that glorious day, when everybody will know everything as we are known. And there will be nothing covered. There will be no psychology. You don't have to make, make any psychological research or scientific research or any kind of a wise research. You just see and you just know. And you know everything. And that glorious day, if you are free today, if you are a child of God today, if your sins have been forgiven today, and if you are living a righteous life today, if you are living a transparent life today, if your life is pure and holy today, following peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, on that glorious day, when you'll be totally free, and you'll walk on the streets of Jerusalem, and the Lord will say, come in here, here is your mansion, and then he here is that of your friend. Here is that of your fellow brother, the fellow sister. What a glorious day. I pray you'll be there. One moment in heaven, five minutes in heaven will make you forget all the years of sorrow, all the years of agony, all the years of embarrassment, all the years of persecution you ever passed through. That's why Jesus told his own disciples, he said, whatever you see while you are here on earth, Whatever you taste, taste of while you are here on earth, and whatever pressure or whatever persecution may be upon you while you are here on earth, never mind. A glorious day is coming. I'm waiting for that day. I said, I'm waiting for that day. And let me read it to you again. It's in John chapter 14, verse 1. John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. If you are thinking about heaven, your heart is not going to be troubled. If you are thinking about the coming of Christ, your heart is not going to be troubled. If you are thinking about the glory that we shall inherit, your heart is not going to be troubled. It's when you are thinking of the things of this world, of the sea, of the pressures of this world, that's when your heart is going to be troubled. It's when you are looking at things that are seen, and you are not looking at things which are not seen. If you are looking at things which are not seen, reserved in heaven for us, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me, in my faith father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again and receive you unto myself that where i am there ye will be also we will be there I come to point number two. In point number two, we're looking at the delight and the destiny of the holy citizens. We're looking at the delight and the destiny of its holy citizens. We're looking at uh, Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter 21, we're reading from verse 9. Revelation chapter 21. I'm reading to you from verse 9. In verse 9, it says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven verse full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither. I will show thee the bride, the lamb, the, the lamb's wife. And then in verse 10 it says, And he carried me away 
in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. And then he now continues to describe the delight of that place. And it, it begins to describe Describe the glory and the beauty of that place. In verse 22, it says, And I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did light in it, and the lamp is a light thereof. And the nations of them that are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. For they shall be, there shall be no night there. And that says in verse 26, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. I need to explain some things to you here. As we're reading about the delight of this holy city and the delight of the citizens there, it tells us in verse 23, and the city had no need of the sun. You remember the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth that we see now, and all the other planets, everything had been rolled up, folded up, and thrown away because the first earth and the first heaven will be no more. They passed away. Therefore, the sun that now is and the moon that now is will not shine in it. The glory of God did light it, did light in it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And then he tells us, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the, in the light of it. The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Does that mean that the whole nation, every nation, like, you know, your nation as your nation, or your country as a country, will totally get to heaven? That's not what he's talking about. I want you to look at First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. The people who are saved, they are regarded as nation. A part is put for the whole. Those of us who are, ch who are children of God were chosen, were selected, and were being taken out of the world, taken out of sin. We become a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 7, reading from verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude that no man could number of all nations. That is it. The nations that are saved. That is, all those who are saved in every nation. Of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Come back to Revelation chapter 21. It says in verse 24, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Anytime you are studying the Bible, you mustn't forget what you have studied already in the past. We have studied in the past already. That is in chapter 20. That whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All the people that remain after Revelation chapter 20 verse 15. They are the people whose names are written in the book of life. All those who are not saved. All those who are rebellious. All those who are repentant, all those who are sinners, they are already, already in the lake of fire. And because they're in the lake of fire, they are not here in chapter 21. So when it says, the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, it's talking about the redeemed of the Lord. It's talking about the righteous. It's talking about the holy ones. It's talking about the saints of God. It's talking about those who are washed white in the blood of the Lamb. Those are the nations he's talking about. And then in that same verse 24, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. The kings of the earth. Again, don't let that confuse you. Because there may be some people that, okay, it means that the people, all these uh, kings, they are do not trust kings. All these chiefs that are going to churches, but they are not born again. All these uh, kings that, you know, they will go to a particular convention or they will go to a particular assembly. Or some of these churches will invite them and they will give them the front seat. 
and they will say you see our church is blessed we have the chief of uh, this particular village is there and the chief of this local council is there and the chief and the king of that place is there and they may come to a passage like this and, and they say and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into this city no all those people who don't have their names in the book of life they're already in hell look at uh, verse uh, 8 again of revelation chapter 21 and the fearful and uh, and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and the mongers and the sorcerers and idolaters all the idolaters will be in hell whether they are high or low whoever they are from where they from wherever they are coming whatever title is given to them but he's talking about the kings who are born again who are those kings that are born again come back to revelation chapter one in revelation chapter one that's why, why i told you don't forget what you learned in the past Whatever you have learned in the past, hold on to that while you're still learning something for the future. And we're told in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, And from Jesus, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests, unto God is and his father. We are the kings. And because of the beauty of holiness in our lives, and because of the shining glory of God in our eyes, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are the king if you are a child of God. And we who are kings unto the Lord will bring our glory into that place and our crowns will be upon our heads and we lay them down at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ in adoration and worship to him. Gratitude to him because of what he has done for us. We're told in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. I'm reading to you there from verse 9. And sung a new song saying... Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. And for thou hast, thou was slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God, kings and priests. We are the kings. When it says, and the king shall bring their glory into that city, it's not talking about these idol worshippers. It's not talking about the religious people that got, just go to church or go to those conventions without being born again and without making restitution. It's talking about the people that know the Lord in verse 10 and has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. I'll be there. I said, I will be there. And may the Lord help you to be there in Jesus' name. In Revelation chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 7. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Those are the people that will be there. They are the people that know the Lord. They are the people who are saved. They are the people who are sanctified. In what sin has been purged? Sin in the heart. Sin in the attitude. Sin that is buried, that nobody will see. They have taken all those hidden things to the Lord. And they have been cleansed, and they have been washed, and they have been purified, and they have been sanctified. The saved, sanctified, pure, holy, saintly children of God. Those are the people that will be there. We are told in Psalm 48, Psalm 48, reading verses 1 and 2. Still talking about this Zion, talking about this Jerusalem, talking about this great beloved city. It says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mount of his holiness, beautiful for situation. And the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Is looking beyond earthly city and is going and is talking about the heavenly city. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow into it. It's looking beyond the earthly scene and it's talking about that scene that is coming in the future. Zechariah chapter 8. Reading from verse 3. Zechariah chapter 8. 
and we're looking at verse 3. As we're looking at all these verses, you're already making up your mind that nothing will hinder you from getting there. Your flesh will not hinder you. Bad habits will not hinder you. That you are going to nail everything to the cross and you are going to have everything crucified, everything poured, everything taken away so that on that day there will be nothing that will hold you back. You are already putting every weight and the sin that does so easily beset you, you are putting it under the cross of the Lord, under the blood of the Lamb so that as you are striving against sin, in the grace of God, in the strength of the Lord, you will be victorious in Jesus' name. Zechariah chapter 8 verse 3 thus says the Lord I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts at the holy mountain we're told in Hebrews is getting nearer now telling us in plain language in clear language that we're talking about heaven we're talking about the city of God in Hebrews chapter 12 reading verses 22 and 23 Hebrews Chapter 12, verse 22. But she had come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to, an, to the general assembly, and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. It's telling us that there's a place, there's such a place called the Mount, Mount Zion. The city of the living God. The heavenly Jerusalem. Where you have innumerable, uncountable company, number of angels. And then is the assembly of the church of the firstborn. The firstborn is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the church of the Lamb. That's the church of the Lord Jesus. And he is the head and the cornerstone of that church. And it says, the general assembly of the church which are written in heaven. If your name is there, then that's how you'll be a partaker there. Revelation chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 5. Revelation chapter 22, reading from verse 5. And there shall be no night there, no. And there shall be, uh, they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. They shall reign forever and ever. You know, I wonder why, how we can be talking of something so high like this, and somebody will be holding on to dust and mud. I wonder how we can be talking of something so glorious, something so beautiful, something so delightsome, and something that, uh, that, that even goes beyond description. And somebody will be licking the dust and lying on the ground and holding on to things that are not essential in this world and holding on to things that, that will soon vanish away. The lust of the flesh and the pride of life and the things of this life that matter, that they matter not at all. I wonder how we can be talking about glory and talking about God and talking about heaven and talking about the beautiful city talking about the new Jerusalem and somebody's heart will still be tied to this world to the dust and the mud and the things that are useless in this world worthless in this world when the Lord should have lifted your heart towards heaven say no Lord come Lord Jesus come quickly I want to be there and yet it may be a little adultery a little fornication a little stealing a little kind of pornography or a little sin that that will not matter at all after all these years have passed and then you want to go to hell because of those things that do not matter at all what a foolish man that will be and what a foolish boy a foolish girl that will be what a foolish individual that will be when something is presented to you that right now you can say lord i let go of the things of this world and the things that attract me and the things that distract me i let them go i want something of heaven and something of zion i want to wear the robe of righteousness i want to I walk on the streets of gold i want to hear the beautiful singing up in heaven i want to be in the midst of those angels and the people of God. I want to see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Samuel and Daniel and Peter and John and Paul the apostle. More than all of them, I want to see the Lord Jesus Christ. A year, two years, ten years, a hundred years, a thousand years, a million years, a billion years, a trillion years, forever and ever, nothing is going to hinder me. I said nothing is going to hinder me. I'm going to be there and you are going to be there in Jesus' name. 
did you hear John was a delighted, excited, and he said, there came to me one of the seven angels, and he talked with me, saying, come either, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb of God, the bride of Christ, all who are washed in the blood of the Lamb, and clothed with the robe of righteousness, will dwell in that city. And then he said, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he lifted me up to a high place where he could, where he could see. He carried me into a great place, a high place where he could see a clear view of this wonderful city. What did he see? He said, he showed me that great city. I mean, the glory of God and a light was like unto the stone of, uh, of the uh, precious stone. And then the foundations of it, he said, the walls, they are beautified and they are garnished with all manner of precious stones. And John, the beloved, had never seen precious stones like this all gathered together in one city. All gathered together in the gates of one city. What a beautiful thing that was. No wonder he, was a, he must have been telling the Lord, oh Lord, I want to be there. You know, sometimes when I read the history of these apostles of God and uh, these uh, people that follow the Lord to, till the end of their lives, I just wondered, how could they endure the great things they endured. Look at the life of Paul the Apostle, for example, and see the great things they endured. And then you wonder, how could a man endure such a thing like this? Then he tells you the reason he endured. He said, I saw heaven, I saw paradise, and I saw the great glory and the great beauty of heaven. And when he came out of that place, after he saw that revelation, then he said, none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. I want to finish my course. And I want to be in that place. And you, you think about John. If you have read about John the Beloved, they put him in boiling oil. And then he will not die. And then they sent him to the, sent him to the Isle of Patmos. So loneliness could have killed the man. Thinking, thinking negative could have killed the man. And the man was all happy. You know why? Because he saw more of the glory of God in the Isle of Patmos than he saw when he was in the city of Jerusalem. Than when he saw when he was in Ephesus. Than what he saw when he was in all those uh, cities of Israel. When he was banished to that place, what he saw delighted him. All those persecutors did not know that they were pushing him more and more into the revelation of heaven. And so he came out of that place and he said, thank you very much for sending me to that Isle of Patmos. When I was in Ephesus, I didn't see it. When I was even in Jerusalem, I didn't see it. And when I was in all those cities of Israel, I didn't see it. But it was when you banished me to the Isle of Patmos in loneliness. And then I saw the glory that I never saw before. And that's, all, that, that's what you need to see also when you go to the Word of God. And you allow the Spirit of God to tell you these things. When you see the beauty of heaven, nothing that happens in this world will matter to you anymore. I pray you will see in Isaiah chapter 60, Isaiah chapter 60, when he's talking about the fact that there will be no night there, and they don't have need of any sun at all. And look at what it says in Isaiah chapter 60, and I'm reading to you from verse, 20, from verse 18. It says, in verse 18, it says, Violence shall no more be had in thy land, wasting no destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy world salvation, and thy gates praise. The sun shall no more be shall, shall no shall be no more than light by day. Neither therefore brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. The sun shall no more thy sun shall no more go down. Neither shall thy moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be thy everlasting light, and the light and the, and the days of thy morning shall be ended. In uh, Psalm 24, Psalm 24, I'm sure you've read this before. You need to read it again. It tells us in uh, Psalm 24, verse 3, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? You know now, what we're referring to as the hill, it carried me up. Unto a high hill, so I could see the heavenly Jerusalem coming down from the Lord. And who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. You understand that? The people that will be there, he that has clean hands, they're sitting money in your office. If you're still with them, your hands are not clean. And in the hospital where you are working, they are committing abortion. If you commit it with them, your hands are filled with blood, your hands are not clean. 
And if they're cheating other people, they are collecting bribes. If you are collecting the bribes with them, your hands are not clean. But it says, the people that will be there. And the people that will get to heaven, he that has clean hands and a pure heart. Pure motive. Pure intention. Pure purpose. Pure feeling. Inside, you are pure. Outside, you are pure. Who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity or sworn deceitfully? He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your head, so ye gaze. Be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your head so ye gaze. Even lift up. Lift them up. Ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. And that's the place the Lord is preparing for his own people. Those who are righteous. Those who are pure. Those who are sanctified. Those who are holy. They will be there. Are there people that will not be there? Yes. That leads us to point number three. The defiled will be denied entry into that heavenly city. And let's look at Revelation chapter 21 verse 27. Revelation chapter 21. We're looking at verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever walketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are reaching in the Lamb's book of life. It says here, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. When it says in no wise, that means on no account. You cannot great crush. You cannot come from behind. You cannot sneak in. Nobody will manage you there. Your father, daddy will not plead for you. Your mommy will not plead for you. Neither will any, anybody be able to plead for you. Neither Samuel, nor, uh, nor, nor David, nor, 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 nor Daniel will be able to plead for you. Even the Lord Jesus Christ will not be able to plead for you at that time. Because the day of grace will have been over. This is the time to prepare. This is the time to be clean. This is the time to be forgiven your sins. This is the time to be saved. And if you die unsaved, in no wise will you be able to enter in. There shall in no wise, under no account, by no means, there you enter, the, enter into it anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever walketh abomination or maketh a lie. The people that make lies, what does that mean? They manufacture lies. Even where there's no need to tell a lie. The lying has become so, so habitual to them that they'll manufacture it. If they don't have a chance to talk, they'll act it out. They'll make it up. They'll manufacture it. They'll produce it. They'll, they'll create it even when it is not necessary. And it says the people that make, manufacture, create, produce lies, they'll not be there. And the people that will be there, they are the people that are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, when he talks about those who are defiled, what does that mean? What is it that defiles men and women? In Mark chapter 7, let's listen to the words of Jesus. Mark chapter 7, reading from verse 20. Mark chapter 7, verse 20. And he said, that which cometh out of the man defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. These are the things that defile people. Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. Those are the things that defile. And it says those who have these defiling things will not enter into that holy city. Thefts, that's stealing, covetousness, wickedness, deceit. That's another branch of lying, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. And it tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, after Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14, I told us to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Then he wants us and counsels us and commands us, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You know what defiles people? Bitterness. Bitterness. What causes bitterness? Offense. 
While you're living in this world, somebody will step on your toes. They may not even only step on your toes, they'll step on your food. Not only they'll step on your life, they'll step on your property, they'll step on your clothes, they'll step on you here and there. And that thing produces bitterness in the hearts of the people that are not ready for heaven. And they say, that person makes me bitter. That person makes me bitter. That person makes me bitter. I'm bitter. How to be bitter? Because they stepped on my toes. They stepped on my life. They stepped on my right. And they stepped on my clothes. And they stepped on my property. I must be bitter. If you must be bitter, you'll go to hell. I was, uh, I've been preaching around about now to different, different places and different people. And I've been telling them something that I discovered. Nobody can make you bitter without your permission. And I had it and I've been telling everybody that the two words bitter and better, the only single letter that makes the difference is the letter I. And it's you, the I, that makes you bitter. If you're bitter against anybody, it's your fault. The difference between better and bitter is I. And you are the one responsible for being bitter. It's not what they do. They have done more than that to other people. They put Daniel in the lion's, in the lion's den. He wasn't bitter. And they, put, and, and they beat uh, uh, Paul the apostle with many stripes. He wasn't bitter. And they put him in the prison with Silas. He was only singing. He wasn't bitter. And they put John the beloved in the Isle of Patmos. He wasn't bitter. And they persecuted the early church and drove them away from their dwelling places. And they became homeless. They were not bitter. And what is it they have not done to people in the past? They were not bitter. It is not what they do to you that makes you bitter. It is the way you think about it. It's because you forget heaven. It's because you are thinking about yourself. It's because you are proud. That's why you say, they step on my toes and they step on my feet and they step on my life. They step on my right. I am bitter. You'll go to hell if you are bitter. Because it says there, the things that defile people, the root of bitterness springing up, troubling them, will defile them. And then it tells us in verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one must of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. I pray God will redeem us. And God will protect us. And all these things that defile will not be in our lives in Jesus' name. You know other things that defile? Your little tongue can defile you. Instead of talking about Christ, talking about the Bible, talking about heaven, talking about the new Jerusalem, talking about the glory that shall be ours, and talking about the inheritance waiting for us in heaven. What are you talking about? You're talking about so and so. And talking about such and such. And talking about that leader. And talking about that member. And talking about that individual. What are you talking about them? All those things will make you defile. And it says, and there shall be no wise. Enter into it. Anything that defileth. Anything that defileth. And talking about other people. Gossiping. Backbiting. Tail bearing. That make you a gossip. That make you a backbiter. Is going to defile you. And then just because of talking about uh, Mr. So and so about Mrs. So-and-so, about Madam So-and-so, about Pastor So-and-so, about Coordinator So-and-so, about Overseer So-and-so, and then you miss heaven. Wait together yourself. Can, that thing you're talking about, just one hour, with bitterness and with anger, and then you miss heaven. How reasonable is that? Why can't you go to the cross and say, Lord, nail this tongue to the cross of Calvary and change me and turn me around. I don't want this kind of thing in my life. I don't want anything defiling. Anything, no matter how small, no matter how big, and no matter how dear it is to you, I don't want anything that will defile me. I want to be purged and purified in the blood of the Lamb. In James chapter 3, I'm looking at verse 6. James chapter 3, verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, and it defileth the whole body, your tongue. My dear sister, how do you talk to your husband? My dear brother, how do you talk to your wife and children? How do you address your parents, members of the church? How do you talk to your pastors? How do you talk about your pastor? Because you see, your tongue can defile you. 
How do you talk to one another, brothers and sisters? How do you dress them down, wash them down, and cut them down? What's your tongue? That can defile you because it says in this verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, the wo- a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on the fire of hell. It tells us in Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19, open your Bible. We're studying the Bible. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31, is something that defiles. We're talking about defilement. And then it says the people that will not reach heaven, the people that will not get to heaven. And then he mentions them one by one. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31. Yeah, it says, regard them, regard not them that are familiar spirits. Neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Those who operate in familiar spirit, you are defiled. Those who have witchcraft, you are defiled. And those who are going to the people that have familiar spirit, and look at my future for me. Read the palms of my hand for me. You are defiled. See, give me some prophecy. You are defiled. Those who are going to people that are using occultic powers and they want prophecy, prophecy, prayer, prayer, you are defiled. Regard them not that are familiar spirits. Neither seek after the wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. It tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 17. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 17, here is a clear word of God. If you defile other people, You mess them up. You commit immorality with them. You introduce those uh, innocent ladies, innocent uh, teenagers into the life of immorality. You defile them and defile their conscience. How can you get to heaven if you don't repent and make restitution? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple ye are? Your actions may defile your own temple. Dirty habit, immoral habit, useless habit, worthless habit. The things you practice by yourself that defile you and defile your conscience. And if you don't repent, we're talking about heaven. And nothing unclean, nothing defiling will enter into that place. Or maybe you are are a young man and then there's another man, you're living together, you're homosexuals together, you're defiling one another together. If you don't repent, don't tell me you're born again, don't tell me you're sanctified, don't tell me you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you're defiling one another, you boys and you, you men, young men staying together. That's defilement. And it says, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And those of you that have maybe maids uh, living with you, you, you are married. And then you'll be sneaking and crawling in the night to go and see those maids and touching them. Those maids may not know because they are fast asleep. And then you are fumbling with them. You are defiled. And if you want to get to heaven, there must be repentance and you must totally be transformed and washed and cleansed and purged and purified by the blood of the Lamb. And that's what the Lord is telling us. That's why we came to study the Bible so that by the grace of God, in the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb, there will be a change, there will be a transformation in our lives. And then when the trumpet shall sound, any time, praise the Lord, we shall be there. I said, praise the Lord, we shall be there. We're told in uh, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And here are the words of Jesus Christ. I mentioned that the words of Jesus Christ, uh, they're very, very important because we know that he is the lamp of that place and is the light of that place. And if even if you are, you know, pushing the words of other people to the background, how about the words of Jesus? Are you going to push that to the background? It tells us in Matthew chapter 13, reading from verse 41, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity the angels of the lord they will not be partial they'll gather out of the kingdom all things that offend and all things that do iniquity they shall and then and they shall cast them into a furnace of fire there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. Do you have ears to hear? Where are you? You have ears to hear? 
You know, many people have come to this church. And some people, since we started in this church, some have sat in that place, in that same place we are sitting now. Some of them are no more in the world. They have gone to the great beyond. And some of them died regretting. Because they left the truth before they died. They defiled other people before they died. And the Lord impressed upon them, make right your way. And make right your life. Be washed and be cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. I preached to them. I cried before them. I shouted the message before them. And I told them, except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. And that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. They had it. Some of them didn't have ears to hear. They perished. They're now in the great beyond, a dying on. But thank God, since we started this ministry, there are those who have had ears to hear. And I rejoice for them. I remember one sister who preached. And she believed holiness to the core. The way we gave it to her, no adulteration, no alteration, no change. She was going to die. Actually, she had sequel cell. But the pain did not bother. She believed in holiness so much. Even when the doctors were to treat her. And the doctor was a man. Said, no, you cannot touch my body. I'm telling you that lady. And then eventually, or there were praying for her. That God will heal her. Said, please, don't pray. Do you see these angels? Look at angel. Look at angel. And look at this wonderful city. Everything was beautiful. And she was just rejoicing like that. That's how she went home to glory. And then we have another brother. And I can see that brother in my mind's eye now. I can see him standing in the, full of, in the fullness of his height and strength. And I see his complexion. He was sick. And we sent people there to go and pray for him. He said, don't pray, don't pray. He said, if you see what I see, you will not want to remain here. Only what you'll do for me is that you'll sing. In my father's house, there are many mansions. Keep on singing, keep on singing. While they were singing, he was gone. Where will you be? Rise up and pray. If you have ears to hear, and you want to get to that heaven, we're talking about heaven. We're talking about the beautiful city. And you don't want any sin in your life. Because anything defiling, anything defiling will stop you at the gate. You will not be able to get there. Stand up everybody, stand up everybody. And open your mouth and open your heart and talk to the Lord. If you have ears to hear today. And if you really want to get to heaven. Who knows when you will die? Who knows when the Lord will come? Who knows when the Lord will call you home? On that wonderful day. The Lord is calling you now. The Lord is saying, have ears to hear today is the day of repentance and today is the day when you can make right your life with the Lord. What are you going to allow in this world to hinder you? Is your name written in the book of life? Is your name written there? Is your name written there in that book of life? Are your sins washed away? Are you pure? Are you purified? Are you cleansed? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? He that has ears to hear, let him hear. The Lord will soon come. And we're talking about the holy city. We're talking about the new Jerusalem. We're talking about the beautiful place where we shall be on that day. Will you be there? Why don't you make up your mind? Any bitterness in you? Any anger in you? Any covetousness in you? Anything in you that will defile you? Anything that will hinder you from getting to heaven? Telling the Lord today, oh Lord, I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready when you will come. Be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Be washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's why you came here to the Bible study. You want to be ready for heaven. You want to be ready for heaven. You want to give your life to the Lord. You want to yield everything to the Lord. Are you saved? Are you born again? And have you broken away from your sin? No sin will enter there. Anything defiling. Anything defiling. That's secret adultery. No secret fornication. All the things you are playing, you are doing with the mage. All the things you are doing with those young ladies. All the things you are doing with other people's husbands, other people's wives. Nothing defiling will be there. And the money you are stealing, though nobody may know today, your life is not transparent, your life is not pure, your life is not clear. If you don't make right your way, where will you spend eternity? Better to bear the shame of being discovered here on earth than to bear the suffering in hellfire.
Where will you be on that day? Where will you be on that day? Do you have ears to hear? Are you going to allow the devil to make you deaf to the sound of the trumpet of warning? Why don't you call upon the Lord? If you are backsliding, come back home. Come back to yourself and say, Lord, I'm coming back. Lord, I'm coming back. Lord, I'm coming back. Lord, I'm coming back. Are you hiding your sin because of your position in the church? You want to keep position and then you want position to lead you to hell? If they hear, what will they say? That will lead you to hell? With all the responsibilities I have in the church, if uh, they know they will take the position away from me, that will lead you to hell? Why don't you call upon the Lord? What shall he profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Call upon the name of the Lord. Let everything be plain. Let everything be transparent. Transparent holiness. Transparent righteousness. That's what will take us to that beautiful city, to that place that is transparent. Is your life clear? As clear as crystal. As clear as glass. That's the place we're going. That's the place we're going. And if you're going to be there, your life must be clear. Your life must be pure. Your life must be transparent. Be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Be a saint, not a sinner. Be a saint, not a backslider. Don't let your tongue defile you. Don't let your attitude defile you. Don't let bitterness defile you. Don't let the things of this world defile you. Don't let covetousness defile you. Talk to the Lord. And say, Lord, here I am. I lay myself before the altar. I lay myself before the altar. Cleanse me. Purge me. Purify me. Take all the defilement away. Take all the defilement away. Take all the defilement away. Make me clean. Make me pure. Pure within and pure without. Following peace with all men. No bitterness. No anger. No malice, no secret sin, no covered of sin, no secret adultery, no secret fornication, no stealing that is covered up. You expose everything. You make a restitution. You are reconciled with God. You are reconciled with your wife. You are reconciled with your husband. You are reconciled with your parents. You are reconciled with your neighbors. And you live every day as if today may be my last day on earth. You are conscious of the coming of the Lord. You are open and sensitive to the touch of the Spirit. You are getting ready for that beautiful city. And you want to be there. 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 Others are there already. But other, there are other people that have missed it. They sat in that same place you are sitting now. They came to this same Bible study. They heard about the repentance. They heard about the restitution. They heard about the righteousness. But they didn't have ears to hear. They didn't have ears to hear. They refused to repent. Now they are gone. Now they are gone. Do you want your case to be like them? Where will you spend eternity? Call upon the Lord and say, Lord, make me ready.